thank you so much for sinking in to listen to my talk. And thank you so much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to have a talk in the first place. Um, today I'll be talking to you about part of my uh, PhD work, which has been focusing on understanding the structure to function connection uh, in the long encoding RNA MEG3. Now, just to put uh, to put everybody on the same level, a small introduction on MEG3. The name starts uh, sta stands for maternally expressed gene three, and with such a name, I guess you won't find it very surprising when I tell you that it is an imprinted gene uh, in such a way that repressive chromatin uh, marks are deposited on the paternal allele of the MEK3 locus, which in humans is located on the long arm of chromosome 14. In mice, it's on the distal part of chromosome 12, which are syntenic chromosomes. Now, owing to this uh, repressive chromatin on the paternal allele, transcription is allowed to only go through from the maternal allele. Uh, upon transcription, MEK3 becomes spliced, and it has many different splicing isoforms, which uh, I will focus on a little bit uh, further uh, during my talk. Apart from splicing, MEK3 also becomes polyadenylated, and it is retained into the nucleus, where it can form uh, contacts with different proteins. And as ribonucleoprotein complexes, it acts onto the genome in trans to regulate the expression of uh, other genes. Now, uh, there's two classes of proteins which uh, have been implicated in, uh, in the function of MEK3. The first one is uh, proteins belonging to the polycom group family of proteins, such as JARID2, for example. And through this type of interactions, MEK3 acts to regulate the expression of important developmental and neurodevelopmental genes, as we can see here on this heat map. Now, the second class of proteins with which MEK3 has been um, connected is proteins belonging to the P53 pathway. And through this type of interactions in turn, MEK3 acts as a tumor suppression. Now, this is the pathway that our lab has been mainly focusing on, and this is what I will be talking about when I characterize MEK3 uh, functionally. Now, uh, as I promised earlier, MEK3 has many different splicing isoforms, and they all seem uh, to carry the splicing pattern that, uh, uh, that keeps exons 1, 2, 3, and 10, 11, 12, while variation arises from the alternative splicing of those middle exons 4 to 9. Now, MEK3 variant 1 is the most abundant variant in all of the cell types where MEK3 is actively expressed. And for this reason, I'm going to use MEK3 variant 1 as my point of reference when I assess uh, the function of MEK3 later on during my talk. Uh, today, I'll also be talking about two more splicing isoforms of MEK3, namely variants 3 and 9. Uh, we chose to study these variants because they show minimal difference in terms of their exon composition compared to variant 1. Uh, variant 3 has one extra exon uh, here, and variant 9 is lacking one exon compared to variant 1. And yet, this minimal difference in exon composition seems to be able to drive quite significant differences in terms of the function of MEK3, uh, as we can see here in this reporter assay where we are assessing the ability of those MEK3 splicing isoforms to um, promote P53 dependent gene expression from a reporter gene. And from this observation arises the first question that I've been trying to uh, answer uh, during my PhD, which is, how does exon composition affect the molecular architecture of MEK3? And how does this architecture in turn affect its function? So to start of, uh, answering this question, we start off with a three-legged approach that depended on characterizing MEK3 at the structural, functional, and evolutionary levels. And for each one of those legs, we had a sort of set of experiments which I will uh, guide you through today. Now, the first experiment that I want to talk about is selective hydroxyl alkylation coupled to primer extension, or for short, SHAPE, which is a technique used to assess the secondary structure of an RNA. Specifically, we started off with in vitro SHAPE, uh, which requires in vitro transcribed um, RNA. 
And before we are able to do any probing um, experiment, uh, we need to bring the sample into a highly pure and homogeneous state. And in order to do that, we utilize this two-step uh, method that requires first on getting rid of the bulk of transcription reaction byproducts by filtering through Manamican column and then uh, passing through size exclusion chromatography at room temperature. Finally, like this, we've, we've, we got a highly pure sample. And in order to bring it also to a homogeneous faulting state, we need to add uh, magnesium ions at physiological concentrations and slowly bring the temperature to 37 degrees. Once we have that, we can probe our RNA uh, with our uh, probing reagents, such as, for example, uh, shape reagents, which are a class of chemicals that will react uh, with, um, with uh, the sugar uh, of, of ribose at nucleotides that are able to, uh, to, the, to be flexible in the folded molecule and will modify those, base, those uh, sugars. Now, once we, uh, if we expose the RNA to reverse transcription, this will uh, cause the reverse transcriptase to drop at every time that it meets one of those modifications. And then if we analyze all the fragments that will be generated through this reverse transcription reaction, we can get an experimentally validated map of those nucleotides in our RNA that are uh, expected to be flexible and therefore most likely not base paired. Uh, by doing that, we first established a purification protocol for the 3 mc 3 splicing isoforms that I showed you earlier. Uh, you can see that we keep only the peak fraction uh, from the size exclusion uh, chromatogram. And here you can see in this agarose gel that it reaches high purity and it migrates as a clear, sharp band. Um, by employing this uh, method, we uh, probe the secondary structures of three different uh, MEC3 splicing isoforms. And this is an experiment that I did uh, together with my colleague, Tina Roda, which was a previous PhD student in the lab. Now, our collective results for the three MEC3 variants, so that there is some, as here I'm showing you uh, the individual nucleotide shape reactivities across the length uh, of all those three uh, splicing isoforms. And what we can see is that there is some regions where these uh, shape reactivities have really good agreement, suggesting very common structural features, whilst we have some other uh, regions where we have disagreement, suggesting domain reorganization events. And this is something that we can see here when we generate a prediction model uh, of our secondary structures uh, based on our experimental results. And we can see, for example, this domain reorganization event here. My favorite example is in variant nine, where we don't really see a distinct domain four and five, but we see them merged into a three primose terminal domain. So the next thing that we wanted to assess was, okay, MEG3 uh, organizes in different domains, but what does this mean? So we employed a, so we wanted to see what the domains mean in terms of function. So for this, we used a Lucifer's uh, assay, a Lucifer's reporter assay. Uh, this works by using a cell line that does not normally express MEC3. And we co transfected with three vectors. The first one encodes our MEC3 construct of interest. The second one encodes the gene for Renilla luciferase under a constitutive promoter, and we use this in order to normalize for transfection efficiency. And finally, we use uh, we, we transfect a, a vector encoding for the firefly luciferase gene coupled to a promoter that is under a p53 element regulation. Once those three vectors are, are delivered into the nucleus, MEC3 will be produced. It will act its effect onto the p53 pathway, ultimately driving p53 protein onto the p53 response element and regulating the expression from uh, the firefly luciferase gene. Now, upon addition of its uh, native substrate, luciferin, the luciferase protein will, be, will produce uh, bioluminescence, which we can measure in a standard plate reader. And with this method, we can um, pseudo quantify the effect of the MEC3 construct of interest onto the P53 pathway. Uh, doing that, 
uh, my colleague Tina assessed the ability of which one of the individual domains that we could find in MEG3 to drive uh, P53 dependent gene expression. And we could see that none of those domains in isolation was able to do that. However, in all cases that we had a combination of domains two and three, we could see, um, we could see a minimal level of activation suggesting that the minimal activation core of MEG3 resides somewhere between domains two and three. Now, uh, in order to assess where exactly and which are the active motifs of uh, MEG3, uh, we went and mutated all of the motifs and uh, features that we could find in domains two and three. And today I wanna share with you our finding about Helix 11, which when we delete it from either one of the splicing isoforms, we see a deleterious effect in terms of the ability of those uh, isoforms to drive P53 dependent gene expression. So then we went on and did some more sort of surgical mutagenesis on those on, on this feature of helix 11 and we see that if we break uh, if we perform mutations only the five prime part of the helical stem this is and this would break the uh, helical interactions and therefore the structure of this of, of this helix this is also a deleterious uh, mutation however when we perform compensatory mutations that would completely change the, the the sequence identity of this helix but restore its structure we rescue this phenotype. And then when we play around with the loop residues, then it's always a deleterious effect in terms of the function of MEG3. So then in this slide, we can turn back to our uh, structural, secondary structural results and focus on uh, Helix 11. Here on the, um, on the left, I'm showing you again the shape reactivities of each individual nucleotide for uh, zoomed in onto the region of helix 11. And we can see that across the three um, variants, we see very good agreement. And not only that, but we also see very good agreement in a peculiar kind of way, because um, the way that shape works, residues that are not base paired would be expected to have high shape reactivity values. However, what we see here consistently across the three variants is uh, very low shape reactivity profiles for the loop residues. So the next question that we thought was that perhaps these uh, loop residues are involved in long range interactions and therefore are involved in the formation of tertiary structures. So in order to assess this, we went uh, into the entire sequence of MEC3 and we looked for sequence patches that could possibly act as donors for the formation of uh, a pseudonaut motif. So we didn't find just one of those, actually, we found six, and they were all residing in domain three, uh, which, if you remember, is the second domain that is absolutely necessary for uh, the minimal activation core of MEG3. And we've, with these six, uh, Sequence. Sequences were located one straight after the other. So for this reason, we named them tandem repeats, TRs for short. And so here I'm showing you the exact interactions that could potentially form between the loop residues of helix 11 and either one of the TRs. And in all of the cases, uh, G370 from the Helix 11 side is found in the middle of those interactions. So as a proof of concept, we mutated this G370 in order to weaken the potential to form pseudonauts with either one of the TRs. And this was indeed um, deleterious in terms of uh, the function of MEG3. Now, uh, when we perform rescue mutations by uh, mutating either one of the TRs, we can uh, rescue this phenotype, however, not at the same level with every one of the uh, different TRs. Now, when we do a sort of complementary experiment where we maintain Helix 11 wild type, but mutate all but one of the TRs in order to force the pseudonaut motif to form by only one of those TRs, we see uh, again, a minimal level of activation, but we see also that not all of the TRs are equally potent 
in driving uh, this uh, functional conformation. So uh, having like that connected a structural feature to the function of a long run coding RNA, we were very interested to see whether this is a unique finding or whether this is something that could potentially be propagated through evolution. So the first thing we did there was um, to uh, align the sequences of uh, MEC3 that we could find in publi publicly available databases. And we could see uh, that when we align the sequences, we get a fairly good alignment, and especially in the regions of domains two and three, which form the active core. Now, when we move on and we use Infernal, which is a program developed by the Eddy Lab, and it can take also uh, structural, secondary structural information in order to uh, uh, fit the alignment so that it also answers to covariation and compatible mutation events, uh, we can extend our original alignment to almost double the number of uh, the initial sequences and now spanning all mammalian uh, classes of animals. This is a more uh, graphical representation of the same finding from the structural based um, alignment, where we can see that the highest level of uh, conservation occurs in this uh, motif of helix 11. And specifically, we have absolute conservation in the regions of the loop. Uh, and we have uh, some covariation and compatible mutation events occurring in the helix, suggesting that in all of the mammalian sequences where we could find MEC3 at all, the ability to form um, the, the, the structure of helix 11 is maintained. Furthermore, uh, we could find at least two uh, sequences that fit the criteria for acting as a tandem repeat uh, in all of those uh, sequences. And in all cases, these sequences would fall uh, in domain three. So like that, we have a structural feature that drives the function of a long encoding RNA with the potential for evolutionary conservation. So we wanted to see how far can we go with exploring the structure of MEC3. And for that, we employed hydroxyradical footprinting and atomic force microscopy. Now, hydroxyradical footprinting is a pro RNA probing type of experiment. Uh, we prepare the RNA in the exact same way that we do for uh, shape. However, uh, the treatment of the, of the RNA happens with uh, highly reactive oxygen radicals, which when they meet the RNA, they will actually break the phosphodiester bond that is connecting to consecutive nucleotides. Now, if we consider that our, if we assume that our RNA is consistently folded into a globular-like structure, the residues that are more exposed by Fold, by folding onto the top, onto the exterior of the molecule, will be uh, will react more frequently with those uh, oxygen radicals uh, compared to residues that are buried in the core of the molecule and are therefore solvent protected. So by employing this experiment, I could see that uh, the five prime part of helix eleven is consistently exposed to the solvent. Uh, whilst the other part, the three prime part of, of the helix is, uh, seems to be uh, protected. This would be sort of compatible with the, with the conformation where the formation of the pseudo knot from the, heli the, the loop residues uh, sort of locks the, uh, the, the, this helix into a conformation where it is um, exposed to the solvent. Now, when we do an experiment, the same experiment, but with a mutant that is no longer able to form the pseudo knot at all, we see a dramatic increase in the solvent accessibility of the residues um, corresponding to the three prime part of the helix, suggesting that upon breakage of the pseudo knot, the entire helix is flopping out into the solvent and uh, exposed to uh, hydrolysis. Now, my colleague Tina in parallel studied MEC3 uh, with atomic force microscopy. And what you could see is that MEC3 is gaining um, structural, structural compaction with um, 
in the presence of uh, mono and divalent ions. And in the behavior that resembles this of RNAs that are known to uh, form compact uh, globular-like structures in the absence of any proteins around them, such as a group two interest, for example, and very much unlike um, unstructured RNAs such as poly A. Now, MEC3 is losing this ability to compact when we do the same experiment with a mutant that cannot form the, um, the, the pseudonot motif. And this is something that we could also see in solution when we assess uh, the uh, folding of, of, the wild, of the wild type MEC3 and the mutant by analytical ultracentrifugation with increasing concentrations of magnesium. All right, so with all of those experiments, we can propose a mechanism where the tightly regulated transcription and splicing of MEC3 uh, regulates its secondary uh, folding into distinct domains. Then those distinct domains interact with each other to form a globular-like state. And then once MEC3 has reached its globular-like state, it can interact with proteins. And as ribonucleoprotein complexes, it can perform its gene regulatory activity. So with this, I would like to end my talk by uh, thanking everybody who made this work uh, possible. Special thanks to Marco, Tina, and Isabel, who uh, were very active in, in helping uh, generate these experiments and discuss them and uh, uh, finish the, the, the work. Uh, special thanks to the organizers for uh, giving me the chance to present to you today. And thank all of you for sinking in today. And uh, I am expecting some very interesting questions and a very good conversation afterwards. Yeah, thank you, Lena. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions, immediate questions from the audience? Uh, in case, uh, please post them using the Q&A button uh, that you find at the bottom of your um, uh, Zoom uh, screen. <clears throat> And uh, in the meantime, maybe Francois, if uh, you are there, you can start activating your video and uh, start uh, sharing your first slide. Okay, we have a uh, couple of questions um, for Lena. Um, how do you explain the difference in activity between the various MEC3 splice variants? Because all those that you showed um, contain the required H11 and the tunnel repeats. Yeah, uh, thanks. That's a really good question. So basically, our current understanding is that the the exactly so the motif of, of, of the pseudonaut holds the active core and then all the surrounding domains that form by the the different uh, exons uh, arrange on top of this core in in different organizations and this is something that we can see also like in in our shape experiment of the different splicing isoforms, we see that the biggest variation in, in shape reactivities and presence of domain reorganizations happens towards the three prime end. And this is where we expect that there is some specific interaction with some protein factor that introduces MEC3 into the P53 regulatory pathway. Um, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, another question. Uh, the previous one was from Job Justin. This one is from Johnny uh, John C. Jones, and uh, they are asking um, about HRF. Um, if you also saw protection in the pseudonaut residues uh, for wild type and the mutants. So we looked. Uh, with so the pseudonaut residues were exactly the part of the helix that uh, I showed, and exactly we see that uh, upon breakage of the pseudonaut, where we maintain the number of nucleotides there, uh, there is increase 
uh, in exposure from the helix 11 part of the pseudonode. And we don't see that that much of incredible uh, differences in the part in the part of the pseudonode receptors of the tandem repeats. Um, yeah. And so we the, see that the yeah the domain two that contains helix eleven is the part that flips out to the solvent. Uh, related to this, Eugene Bolin is asking uh, about how the shape reactivities um, change uh, in the tunnel repeat uh, regions and in H11 when you make the mutations, I guess. Yeah, so the in, in, in H11, exactly, we see uh, a increase in shape reactivities when we make the mutants, suggesting that, yeah, this this loop in the loop residues the helix residues are obviously maintained non-reactive and in, in in the part of the tandem repeats we don't see that much of difference but, which we explain by the fact that the the interaction is transient and the also in in the wild type and the helix 11 the tandem repeats can also form sort of helixes with other uh, parts of the molecule. So in the absence of uh, the pseudonode, they will form base pairs uh, with other residues of domain three. I'll take one more question from Kelly Dean and then uh, I'll ask uh, the others to uh, join us later on Discord as we discussed before. So Kelly is asking you, um, well, is congratulating you for the great talk and asking uh, if there are any known direct protein interactants to helix 11? Uh, not to our knowledge. So we tried to look at some, we couldn't find any. We've ex and uh, through multiple experiments, we've excluded the possibility of proteins binding directly onto helix 11. Uh, if you would like, I can invite you to continue the, con the con conversation on Discord. Yeah, let's do that. Great, Lena. Thank you very much. And Thank then, you very um, much. Phil. We give the stage to Francois to explain us uh, about uh, SPAN and transcription silencing. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so my title is actually a little bit different from what I had uh, originally uh, thought because I'll be mainly presenting some unpublished data today. Um, and so I actually just recently graduated from Edith's lab and, and in Edith's lab we we're interested in a process called X chromosome inactivation. Um, so why is this? Yeah, there we go. So I don't think I'll surprise anyone uh, by telling you that uh, in mammals, males have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, but females have two copies of the X chromosome. And the Y chromosome is actually a fairly small chromosome, encoding only approximately 70 genes in humans. However, the X chromosome is a very large chromosome, encoding more than 800 genes in, 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 in humans. And so females, hence, have to cope with having a double um, expression of X-linked genes. Uh, and this is actually very problematic. And so evolution has selected actually a, a, a female specific dosage compensation mechanism called X chromosome inactivation, which we abbreviate into XCI. And this describes uh, a phenomenon wherein one of the two X chromosomes in female cells is transcriptionally silenced across the entirety of the X chromosome. Uh, and this is a process actually that happens during early embryonic development. This process happens and absolutely all um, female therian mammals. Uh, I've put some examples here, uh, but fortunately this is a process that we can also model in vitro um, in, in mouse actually by using cells called mouse embryonic stem cells, which are directly derived from the inner cell mass of uh, female early blastocysts. And these mouse embryonic stem cells uh, have the uh, characteristic of having two active X chromosomes and upon differentiation in culture, they undergo X chromosome inactivation. So one of the two X chromosomes is uh, transcriptionally silenced in such a way that after differentiation, all the cells have only one active X chromosome. Now we know actually for, for um, quite some time now that this process is actually regulated uh, entirely by a non-coding RNA called EXIST, which is actually encoded on the X chromosome. 
Uh, and so the process of exon activation starts with the monoallelic upregulation of the exist transcript. Uh, and this RNA uh, has the amazing capacity, and this is still fairly en enigmatic, to coat the chromosome in cis. So it basically forms the structure which we call the exist RNA cloud strictly on the X chromosome from which it is expressed. And this is accompanied by chromosome-wide gene silencing across the whole X chromosome. Now in the lab, we're very interested in this process because uh, it's, it's a paradigm actually for the study of epigenetics as it, it involves uh, chromosome-wide changes occurring at the levels of transcription, chromatin marks, 3D structural organization of the chromosome, and this is mediated by long encoding RNA. And on top of that, this can be tracked at thousands of loci, so it's fairly convenient for um, quantitative analyses, and it's a process that's developmentally regulated. But a question that has been uh, very enigmatic in the field for quite some time is how does EXIST actually mediate this gene silencing? And so why this remained enigmatic is because it was fairly challenging on a technical level to actually identify which proteins interact with EXIST. In 2015, however, three labs independently developed um, these uh, methods that allow for affinity purification of exist RNA, followed by mass spectrometry so as to identify which factors actually bind exist. And so I've summarized on the slide some of the key factors that were retrieved. Um, so this is the structure of the exist RNA. Uh, it has these uh, motifs uh, that are basically co uh, composed of different uh, repeats. And uh, one of the protein that was retrieved and found to interact with the A repeat is RBM15. And this was shown to be uh, important to bring the M6A RNA methylation complex uh, so as to uh, mediate M6A RNA methylation of EXIST. Now, the, the role of this mark on EXIST is fairly uh, still uh, unknown. Uh, this, this region of EXIST was shown to be bound by a protein called HNRNPK, and we now know that this is the protein that is responsible for the massive recruitment of polycomb repressive complexes during X inactivation. Um, there were different uh, sequences also within EXIST that were found to interact with LBR, the lamin B receptor. Uh, and this was shown very elegantly to be uh, uh, important to actually tether the inactive X chromosome to the nuclear envelope. And actually it's since decades, it's been observed that the inactive X chromosome is often localized uh, at the nuclear envelope. And so now we know uh, the mechanistic basis for such a link. And finally, and this is the protein that I'm going to be focusing on today, uh, this massive protein called SPAN was found to interact also directly with the A repeat of EXIST. Now, SPAN is, is really a huge protein. It's metazoan specific. Uh, in mouse and humans, it's approximately 400 kilodaltons. Um, and as you can see here, it's composed um, of uh, some RNA recognition motifs at its N terminus, which are very nicely conserved. And at its C terminus, it has the Spock domain, which will be the main center of the presentation uh, today. And I'll come back to that a bit later. Uh, but what early, earlier studies showed in the field of exon activation is that SPAN actually binds exist directly, thanks to these RNA recognition motifs. And they showed that it appeared to be important for gene silencing. Uh, and so the, the goal of my PhD was really to characterize to which extent is SPAN important for the process of exon activation and through which mechanisms uh, does it actually influence the process. So on this slide, I've summarized some of the work that is now published. Uh, so we, we showed actually that SPEN is, is really absolutely crucial for triggering chromosome-wide gene silencing during X activation. So we showed actually if you deplete the SPAN protein either in mouse embryonic stem cells or in, in embryos in vivo, you have complete absence of transcriptional silencing on the X chromosome. Using uh, a chip-like assay called Cut and Run, it was developed by the lab of Steve Hanikoff, um, we also showed that actually exist dynamically recruits SPAN to enhancers and promoters of specifically active genes, so genes that have um, RNA polymerase to uh, transcribing them. And upon its recruitment to these, to these uh, loci, SPAN triggers uh, tra trans loss of transcription uh, through mechanisms that still need to be understood. And upon gene silencing, the favorable context that was uh, permitting SPAN binding, which was transcription, is lost. And so SPAN actually disengages from uh, the silenced chromatin. Uh, 
And uh, in trying to figure out uh, through which domain spin actually mediates its function, we found that if we knock out endogenously the Spock domain of spin, there is also uh, absolutely no X chromosome inactivation, or let's say virtually no X chromosome inactivation happening, showing that this domain is really essential for the process. Now, to better understand how this domain functions, um, we, we made use of uh, a really nice tethering approach where we knock in some stem loops called BGL stem loops onto the exist RNA. This allows the tethering of a BGLG protein, which uh, in this case was fused to Spock. So this allows us to artificially recruit Spock to the X chromosome. And we did this in the context where we can degrade span, the endogenous span, and ask upon the forced recruitment of, span, of, of Spock to the X chromosome, do we compensate for the loss of endogenous span? So we did this experiment using a uh, just a regular BGL uh, GFP control fusion protein, and we looked at x gene silencing. And remarkably, what you can see when we do RNA-seq on, on different clones is that if you just tether the BGL-GFP alone, for most of the genes on this density plot, which is shown here, the repression score, so how much they're going to be silenced uh, upon the loss of span, is centered on zero. So basically, this tethered protein fails to compensate for the absence of span. However, if you tether the Spock fusion protein, you can see that for many, many genes, you start seeing uh, a drastic uh, effect on gene silencing. And, and actually, most of the genes on the X chromosome show very significant signs of silencing. So then the question is to try to understand how Spock can so potently repress transcription. So to answer this question, we did um, immunoprecipitation of Spock followed by mass spectrometry to characterize its protein interactome. And we found several protein complexes coming down with Spock, starting with the NCOR SMRT complex, which is known to be required to activate histone v acetylase 3. So this interaction was actually already published in the past. Um, we also found uh, the NERD complex, which is a, a nucleosome remodeling complex that's involved in, in transcriptional silencing. We also found the whole M6A RNA methylation machinery. And most importantly, we found um, polar 2 a so the main subunit of RNA polymerase 2. Um, and, and so we proposed this model, which we published, that SPAN actually is able through its Spock domain to engage with several mechanisms at the same time to efficiently silence transcription. So what I'm going to be focusing on today is work that we haven't published yet, is to try to, to ask the question whether through its interaction with RNA polymerase 2, could Spock actually directly interfere with transcription? So here I'm just showing a Western blot to, to uh, <laughs> convince you that Spock indeed co-purifies with RNA polymerase 2. Uh, and and um, the, the hypothesis that, that we, we put forward before starting the experiment was that potentially uh, Spock could interact with the C-terminal domain of, of RNA polymerase 2 directly. And there are several lines of evidence as to why we, we put this hypothesis forward. So the CTD of RNA polymerase 2 is very unique in the sense that it's composed, uh, at least in mouse and humans, of 52 repeats of this YSPTSPS uh, heptapeptide. Um, and importantly, and this is happening in vivo, in, in, in organisms, uh, these residues, some of them can be subject to post-translational modifications, and especially the serines that I've highlighted here. And we know that the phosphorylation of these serines is intricately linked to the transcription cycle. For example, we know that serine 2 phosphorylation, when we look at how it's distributed, so the, let's say phosphorylated, serine 2 phosphorylated uh, RNA polymerase 2, how it's distributed by a chip seek, we see that it's dramatically enriched around the transcription termination uh, site. On the other hand, serine 5 phosphorylation is mainly enriched around the transcription start site, and it's a mark that's associated uh, with promoting initiation of transcription and, and the transition of, from initiating initiation to productive innovation. Finally, serine 7 can also be phosphorylated, and its role with respect to mRNA transcription is still fairly uh, unknown. And, and this is how its distribution globally looks like um, at low site. And now if we compare these profiles uh, with the span binding profile on the X chromosome during X inactivation, here I'm just showing one X-linked gene where span goes, but this holds true for absolutely all X-linked genes. You can see that span is really enriched at the transcriptional start site 
uh, and not uh, at, at, uh, over the rest of the gene, suggesting that there is a link uh, with serine 5 phosphorylation potentially. Furthermore, as I was telling you, Spock is a direct interactor of the SMRT complex. Um, and what's been published already uh, is that this interaction requires um, serine phosphorylation within the SMRT moiety for it to happen, showing that Spock is already a phosphor reader in that sense. And finally, um, there is a preprint that came out um, actually in 2019, I believe, from DS Lads's lab that showed that PHF3, which is a protein that also has a Spock domain, actually uh, through its Spock domain interacts directly with the CTD of RNA polymerase 2. And in this case, specifically when serine 2 is phosphorylated. So in our case, we hypothesized uh, maybe Spock, in the case of SPAN, interacts with serine 5 phosphorylated uh, RNA polymerase 2. So to test this hypothesis, we had to do um, uh, biochemistry and structural biology. And this is really not the expertise of our lab. But when we came up with those questions, uh, it actually happened that the lab moved from Institut Curie to Embel in Heidelberg, where uh, there are a lot of great structural biologists, especially in the person of Christoph Müller and Brice from Christoph's lab, who also heads the crystallography platform there. And so we collaborated with them to try to answer this question. So we purified Spock. Um, and the first thing we did was to do um, in vitro binding assays using ITC with different RNA-P2 CTD phosphopeptides. And so this was done in collaboration with um, the biophysics platform at Emble in Heidelberg with Catherine and then later on with Karine. Uh, and so here I'm just going to show a, a summary of, of the results that we have. So we incubated Spock with different um, CTD peptides, either uh, non-phosphorylated or with these different single phosphorylations. Uh, and so here are the results. So if you incubate the peptide only, so without Spock, you get no heat response. Now for uh, the unphosphorylated peptide, as well as the serin 2 and serin 7 phosphorylated peptide, you can see that when we incubate them with Spock, you see virtually no response. However, if you incubate them with the serin 5 phosphorylated peptide, you, you see uh, a nice heat response that shows a direct interaction that seems to be specific to serine 5, uh, and the affinity is, is relatively weak, it's around 10 micromolar. Um, and so we then uh, went on to characterize this interaction at a structural scale. So for this, we, we um, incubated Spock with phosphopeptide, we did co-crystallization screening, we obtained crystals, and we um, did X-ray diffraction, collected data at the synchrotron in Hamburg, and we actually managed to resolve the structure at 1.8 angstrom. So uh, this is mainly the work of Brice, actually, as I really have absolutely no expertise in, in uh, structural uh, resolution. Now, what you can see here is this is the uh, RNA polymerase to phosphoserine 5 peptide. You can see that the serine 5 that's phosphorylated really docks into this uh, basic patch of, of the Spock domain. And when we zoom in a little bit more, you can see that uh, several basic residues within the Spock protein seem to be engaged in interactions with this phosphoserine. And so we then asked whether um, these, indeed, these residues are really important for the interaction. Uh, and so at that time, actually, I had left the lab. I had generated the, the mutant constructs, but never got the chance to test them. But thankfully enough, um, a new postdoc joined Edith's lab and was able to carry out these experiments. And so um, two key amino acids so far were um, replaced with alanines. And what you can see is that these mutants are completely unable to interact uh, with serine 5 phosphopeptides, really showing that they are indeed really vital for the interaction. And so now the key question uh, that needs to address is the functionality of this interaction between Spock and RNA polymerase II. So is it really important, at least in the context of X inactivation for mediating transcriptional silencing? So for this, we actually have an ideal system because we can artificially tether Spock in our mass embryonic stem cells and see whether um, it complements the loss of SPEN. We know that it does under well-type conditions. And now we can actually tether different point mutants um, uh, it, within Spock that are not able to engage with the RNA polymerase to machinery and see whether they still complement for the absence of SPEN. Um, but right now, the model that I'm envisioning uh, is, is this Spock Garden model. 
where um, given that the, the heptapeptide is repeated several times in the CTD of pol 2 in vivo, and we actually have in vitro data that shows that multiple Spock molecules actually interact with the same CTD molecule, we can imagine that Spock actually competes with crucial transcription factors uh, like the capping enzymes and so on and so forth for binding to to serine 5 uh, CTD. And this somehow hinders the transcription fact, uh, process uh, and, and later on leads to X chromosome inactivation. So the, the general uh, take home message uh, that I want to give is that SPEN actually is a um, initially, let's say dormant protein, but through RNA dependent mobilization, so in this case through exist mobilization, it can become concentrated uh, at different loci and lead to potent silencing of target genes. So if you look actually with microscopy um, in the cells, what SPEN looks like when you induce X inactivation, you can see that it's drastically enriched. This is the X chromosome here. And so there really is this increase in local SPEN concentration that probably uh, can support uh, an effect uh, on pole two, given the direct interaction between SPEN and serine 5 phosphorylation. Uh, and we believe that SPEN is such a potent silencer because not only does it engage with RNA polymerase two, but it's also able through that Spock domain to interact with NCORE and activate histone deacetylation at enhancers. So that's something we published previously, and we know this is important for X inactivation. But we also have preliminary data that its interaction with the NERD complex is also important for mediating gene silencing. And last but not least, uh, we know that several other SPEN related proteins um, are also important in RNA mediated uh, gene silencing. SPEN actually also in mouse has been shown by Howard Chang's lab uh, to bind directly to these ERVK transposons and silence through transcription or nascent transcription, should I say. Spock D1 in mouse, which is also a uh, protein that has a Spock domain, was shown to be required for pi RNA dependent silencing of transposons by interacting uh, with NERD also, but also with the DNA methylation machinery. And finally, in plants, there are several SPEN-related proteins. So SPEN is, uh, per se doesn't exist in plants. However, you have uh, several proteins that have RNA recognition motifs combined to a Spock domain, like FPA, which has also been shown to be doing RNA-guided DNA methylation. And finally, border proteins in 2019 uh, were shown to have a Spock domain and to actually promote transcriptional insulation. Uh, so between genes and plants by uh, regulating pull to pausing at their three prime end. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, um, I'd like to thank especially all these people. So Edith, uh, who was my PhD supervisor, um, for all these uh, three, four years of PhD and, and of exciting science. Christophe and Brice for this uh, absolutely amazing collaboration and, and Florence also from Christophe's lab for her great insights. Catherine and Karine from the platform at Emble for the, all the help on the ITCs. And finally, Joyce, so uh, a new postdoc in our lab who is continuing now this project and all the members of, of, of the HERD lab, and last but not least, uh, Beringer, who was involved in funding my PhD. Thank you, Francois, very nice talk. Um, we already have a couple of questions in the chat, if you're mm -hmm. ready. Yeah, uh, yeah. Jonesy is asking, um, well, congratulating you for the talk, and, mm -hmm. uh, and asking if you have checked uh, multiple phosphorylations on, uh, on yes. the poll 2 um, uh, chain, uh, whether that's biologically relevant or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have uh, tested these uh, du dually phosphorylated peptides, so for example, serine 2 and serine 5 phosphorylated peptides, or serine 2, serine 7, or serine 5, serine 7, so in, in different combinations. It is indeed biologically relevant because we know in vivo that the polymerase uh, has simultaneous phosphorylations at, at different stages of the transcription cycle. And what we found was that this had no impact on the ability of Spock to interact with serine 5 phosphorylated peptides. So let's say if you have serine 5 phosphorylation, but also serine 2 at the same time, this doesn't change the affinity 
neither does it increase or decrease it. And, um, and, and the specificity for serine 5 doesn't change. So it, you don't start seeing binding to serine 2 or serine 7 if you have other uh, first relation of serines. So it looks like Spock really has some affinity for a polymerase that is in the early stage of the transcription cycle, which is compatible with this role of SPEN in, in really hindering transcription rapidly of the genes during X chromosome inactivation. We have another question from uh, Kumar Abula, who's uh, saying wonderful work. Uh, can you comment on how SPEN targets to the X chromosome for inactivation? Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe I uh, add to this um, one of my own. Um, you have shown beautifully the interplay between SPEN and its POC domain and RNA pool too. Um, what's the role of existing all that? Is mm -hmm. it tuning mm -hmm. the interaction or mm -hmm. yeah, is it so... just a, a bite uh, for, for rec recruitment? Yeah, so indeed, these, these two questions are, are linked. And so I'll answer the first one very briefly. So the specificity of SPEN for targeting the X chromosome is really promoted by EXIST. So I didn't mention this very much. Um, and this is actually how X inactivation is linked to the RNA field is that it's really depending on this scaffolding RNA, which is EXIST. So EXIST, because it binds to the X chromosome and because it has such a strong affinity for SPEN, this is how SPEN gets to the X chromosome. Uh, and so, Importantly, indeed, when we're looking at this interaction between Spock and, and Pol2, it's a very artificial system and the, the RNA component is, is absent in, in the reaction. And I think that it will be important to address whether um, on top of that, if you add exist into the system, whether this maybe increases uh, the affinity. It's a tricky experiment because Spock per se doesn't bind uh, exist, right? Uh, it's the protein span that binds through the RNA recognition motifs. And the RNA recognition motifs are 400 kilodaltons away from Spock. So the ideal experiment would be to purify full length span, put it with a polymerase and add full length exist, which is 17 kilobases uh, or not and see whether this changes anything. Um, but I think the RNA component is absolutely crucial because you, it helps to locally concentrate SPEN and, and, and make use of this affinity between SPEN and pool 2 which is not a very strong affinity, but I think if you increase the local concentration, maybe that weak affinity has some relevance, uh, at least locally. Uh, somehow on the same line, Rotuya is asking you, um, was saying, uh, thank you for such an interesting talk. And what could be the basis for um, the selection of a specific X chromosome from the X chromosome pair uh, mm -hmm. for silencing? Yeah, uh, so I'm really not an expert on, on this question. It's a burning question in the field that several labs are trying to, to address this. Um, I, if you're interested in this, I advise you to look at the work of Eda Schulz, who is in Berlin. Um, so there are a lot of models, stochasticity, how, how one X is privileged over the other. Um, it's really complex. And there was a hypothesis in the time that uh, based on the nuclear positioning of the, of the two X chromosomes, this is going to favor one over the other. However, there is a really a fail safe mechanism that you always inactivate every chromosome but one. So if you have three X chromosomes, you'll inactivate two of them and keep one active. So there is this counting uh, mechanism and, and there is also this choice um, aspect that is still uh, enigmatic. There are several players that have been started to be characterized, but the model is still insufficient to fully recapitulate what is observed. Sorry, I could I cannot answer better this uh, this question. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I'll I'll take one more question for you, um, uh, Francois, and then we'll move to the Discord platform. Uh, so mm -hmm. Srivaza um, Abhishek Prakash is asking, um, is saying great talk and work. Um, could you tell about how SPEN disengages from the X chromosome? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if it has such a high affinity for exist, um, can it also disengage? No. So this is a uh, an aspect that uh, actually back when we were under review, uh, the reviewers were a bit uh, skeptical about. Um, and here we really have to distinguish between SPEN being in the vicinity of the X chromosome and SPEN being actually engaged with chromatin. Uh, SPEN is not a bona fide DNA binder. 
And so I think the interaction with chromatin is strictly mediated by the chromatin components it actually interacts with physically. So the nerd complex, the polymerase, and so on and so forth. And so we propose that it, it disengages from chromatin because what we see is that when we do cut and run, we lose the spend peaks at the parts that have been silenced, whereas we still observe them at parts that haven't been silenced, genomically speaking, which means that basically spend is distant from the chromatin. However, when you look by microscopy, spend is still in the vicinity of the chromosome because exist is still there. So it's just a question of distance to chromatin. Uh, and if you don't have the proteins that span binds to, then it cannot engage with the chromatin, right? Uh, so this is, how, this is how we envision the model. Uh, but I think now um, some experiments of like high resolution microscopy would be helpful to really show that the distance between the DNA or the chromatin and SPEN actually uh, changes over time. Um, but SPEN is really still close to the X chromosome, right? Because it's still bound to exist. Excellent. Congratulations, Francois. And uh, thanks to... And thank you very much for organizing all this. Well for, for both thank you very talks. much for the invitation. Um, thanks to all the attendees and the exciting questions that uh, were shared and discussed uh, already now live. Uh, Martina uh, has just shared with you in the chat uh, again the instructions uh, on how to connect to this new server, uh, this, uh, this core platform, uh, if you're interested in uh, um, keeping up the conversation. Uh, with the speakers and uh, so see you there uh, in a few minutes um, uh, Florian uh, sorry Francois Lena and myself I guess we're already connected and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you all there um, thank you very much and bye bye this is good <laughs>